But I tell you what, Jesse Styers, let's just bring out that whiteboard. I think that people have been waiting for it. They've been at some points demanding it, if not completely demanding it. Oh, Gage, come on. Carter's not an idiot. Carter's a Carter's a very sharp guy. <laughs> let's let's pump the brakes now. Come on. Come can on. Can you see this? Um, I can. I think that we're um, let me see. All right. So is this the first offensive play that we talked about earlier? Yeah, this would be um first offensive play. So kind of right now what you're looking at is 11 personnel. Um, you have Bo Collins, which is, you can see, I, I, I labeled them by number. So Bo Collins is number five. Over he's going to be the, the left. Yeah. He's going to be the boundary wide receiver. This ball um, we're, we're looking at the ball on the left hash. So Bo Collins, number five is going to be into the boundary um, and to the field side. We have slot number one, Jaden Greathouse. Um, and then the field side wide receiver is number 10, Chris Mitchell. And then right now we are in shotgun with um, Jeremiah Love also split out to the field side. Um, and so I guess one of the first things that you'll see. Okay, hold it, hold it, hold it. I just want to make sure now. Do we have Mitchell Evans on the field? This is 11 personnel, right? Is that Mitchell Evans attached there on the left side of the line? That is correct. Mitchell okay. Evans is attached here on the left side. It's really hard to make an eight. I'll try to make two of them. That's there not, it is. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So, yeah, Mitchell Evans will be um, number 88 and also into the boundary. And so, in some regards, this is kind of what you would call a balanced look in terms of, you know, receiving threats. You have two guys on each side, two guys in the boundary, two guys into the field side. All right. And we've got, I, I think, a couple of, of keys potentially – in this matchup, and I'll see kind of where you go with this. One is how much motion they're able to use, how much pre-snap motion with, with all the crowd noise and all that kind of stuff, but how they employ both the tight end, whether it's Mitchell Evans or Raritan or whoever it happens to be, and Jeremiah Love, I think specifically because of Love's versatility. Yeah, so Jeremiah Love is going to be you know, he's going to be a center point in this game, in my opinion, because he is going to be able, you know, to really give you kind of some unbalanced looks because if Jeremiah Love motions out of the backfield, that instantly is going to create, you know, some stressors on the defense. So give us an example of that. Yeah, so uh, immediately what, you know, you could look at here. Um, the, the reason why Mitchell Evans is placed here on the end line of scrimmage into the boundary is immediately he's going to provide an extra kind of layer or help for your starting left tackle who happens to be a true freshman, right? So what can you do in order to mitigate, you know, that stress? Well, you can put an experienced tight end right next to him. And even if Mitchell Evans is running a route, he can chip this end man of the line of scrimmage. It can be almost a double team off the line of scrimmage, and then Mitchell Evans can either stay if it's a true run scheme, or he can release out and, you know, run a route. But initially, he is going to get his hands on that end man of the line of scrimmage, right? He is going to at least give Anthony Knapp a second to breathe, right, to kind of get his bearings. I think that's going to be even more important the first series of the game while Knapp is getting his feet underneath of him. Okay. And so what you can do now is if you motion out Jeremiah Love to this field side, now you've created more so of an unbalanced look. Now you have three wide receivers to the field side, two wide receivers, you know, into the boundary. But immediately what this is going to – motioning to the field side stresses the defense because it forces them, you know, to stop, to stop the pass, you know, to this side – uh, and so they have to save defenders to cover, you know, receivers to the field side. And so now you are a defender, you know, maybe short into the boundary where a lot of these more kind of power run or, you know, maybe counter schemes could happen with Riley Leonard. So when you create, you know, this this motion to the field side, you're putting a lot of stress on the defense because now they need to commit an extra defender 
to the run game. So that's, you know, one of the first things that motion can do. Um, and then the second thing that motion can do, and this is what we've talked about before, is it's going to give a tell, you know, to what the defense is doing coverage wise. Are they going to be more so in a man scheme? Are they going to be more so in a zone kind of scheme? Um, and those are early indicators for Riley Leonard. And the earlier you motion out, the sooner, you know, if Riley Leonard doesn't like what he's seeing, he can, you know, audible in to something else. Maybe you you motion Jeremiah Love out there, you don't like what you see, and you can still bring him back to the backfield, right? And so I think this gives, in, in a perfect world, in my opinion, you always have one or two, like multiple plays called based on what you see out of the defense, right? And so motion allows you, in my opinion, to get into statistically the better play, the play that's going to give you, that's going to have a higher success rate. Now, I get the idea of having Mitchell Evans there attached next to Anthony Knapp as a first-time starter, and you talked about first series especially, you know, kind of get feet under him and, and that kind of stuff. But how potentially, you know, again, when you're talking about manipulating the box, whether it's 11 personnel 10 personnel, whatever it happens to be, when you're talking about manipulating that box to try to open up the running game, what kind of looks do you think Mike Denbrock and Notre Dame might be looking at? Yeah, I think when when you're in terms of manipulating the box, um, kind of what I was just talking about here, you want to try to find a way to stress the defense more into pass so they have to commit an extra defender to pass. Um, and that's going to free up the box, especially on RPO looks, because these, you know, RPO looks with someone like Riley Leonard, because these linebackers are going to have to honor the pass first and RPO. So not only are they going to be, you know, more so on their heels and a less defend and, and a, you know, defender outside the box that has to defend the run. Well, one less defender in the box means that's one extra defender or one less defender that, you know, Riley Leonard and the offense would have to beat essentially. Um, in the run game. So I expect Notre Dame to be able to run the ball really well inside. I, I don't see them a lot of running outside because I think that's where a lot of your kind of RPO and looks are like that are going to look. I think if they're going to run well between the run well, it's going to have to be between the tackles essentially. Right. Um, and I think that's going to be, you know, via a lot of kind of Riley Leonard, maybe fake handoffs where he pulls it and is running you know, basically straight up the gut because you're going to influence defenders to leave the box, you know, get more horizontal. And that, that allows Ryan Leonard to get vertical and go through the box essentially. I mean, I, I think that that is an area to, to look at as well, because I think that Notre Dame's interior linemen are the de especially like when you look at Ashton Craig at center and then Billy Shrouth, on the right side, like those are the road grader kind of guys. And again, like listening to Carter, if there's a, I don't even want, I, I don't know that it's weakness, but if there's maybe a soft spot when you've got a defensive end moving inside, even as big as he is, he's moving inside to, you know, to, to play defensive tackle. That feels like an area that, that, you know, Notre Dame should at least try to take advantage of Saturday night. Oh, hundred percent. They they need to again. I would expect a lot of you know if Riley Leonard's going to run the ball, I, I would expect it a lot of kind of you know power power schemes up the middle where he might even be faking the ball to the hand to the running back, and he's going to that running back is now going to lead or basically his role is going to be the lead blocker for Riley Leonard through the hole. He's going to you know pick up the first guy that he sees, but again the more you can influence the perimeter and get guys to commit to these, you know, underneath shallow, quick RPO routes and get them to vacate the box that allows, right. you know, Riley Leonard to get vertical through the box right now. So I think that's a lot of what Mike Denbrock would, would, you know, try to scheme up essentially. Cause you know, Texas A&M is going to have athletes on the perimeters. Their defensive ends are going to be good. Their linebackers are going to be quick. I don't think Notre Dame should try to mess with outrunning teams you know, on the perimeter to the sideline, etc. I think they need to focus more on their power um, and, and being able to literally run right up the gut. How much do you think that, like, would you stay in 11 personnel quite a bit in this game? You know, whether it's helping out with 
you know, with, 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 with that inexperienced left side of the line or, you know, just with some of the other mismatches that you can cause and manipulation and things like that with a bigger bodied tight end, you know, to like just, just moving Evans or, you know, like I said, Raritan, whoever it happens to be moving them around to different spots. Yeah. I, I do think that 11 personnel is advantageous because what you can do, you know, like, let's say, let's say that, and the, for example, you know, they go towards, um, let me try to get this. You know, now let's say we split out Mitchell Evans. Um, what you can do is, again, if you don't like that look, you could always motion down Mitchell Evans and allow him to attach to the line of scrimmage. So you can come mm-hmm. out and show a more kind of spread out formation. And then again, if you're not getting the look that you like, you could always, you know, bring Mitchell in and kind of put him as the end man on the line of scrimmage. But the reason why I think you always need some sort of tight end on the field, especially Again, we know that Marcus Freeman wants to control the ball, control the pace, and run the control ball. The like, line of scrimmage. Running yep. the ball and controlling the line of scrimmage is going to be, you know, a staple of this game. So they can't they can't just go empty or you know spread everything out. They still need to be able to run between the hashes, essentially, right? And so how you're gonna be able to achieve that with a young offensive line, especially at left tackle, is you're gonna bring in someone, you know, an extra big body like Mitchell Evans and 11 personnel and allow him to help out in the blocking game, specifically when you're running. I wouldn't, I would imagine that in a lot of their run concepts this weekend, they will at least have one tight end on the field, but what you can also do, you know, it, you can, you can do things like sprint out or roll the pocket away from the left side, right? Like Riley Leonard can, can move, can work over to the right. And that allows, that's just longer than that defensive that defensive end has to, you know, basically cover more ground on the backside to get to Riley Leonard. So I, I, I would see a lot of that as well, you know, kind of maybe, and that, that goes with the RPO looks, these kind of sprint out looks where the quarterback is literally taking the ball and he's immediately kind of, you know, arcing out or sprinting out towards sideline to sideline, moving the pocket with him and getting the ball out quick. You know, and I know you've, you've talked a lot about, like Leonard being the guy running between the tackles and, and stuff like that. I mean, don't rule out either Jeremiah Love or Jadarian Price being able to do I think that's, some of that. That's where Jadarian Price is really going to come in to play because I think Jeremiah Love is more of your kind of quicker, you know, quick twitch perimeter type runner. And I think Jadarian Price, maybe even Aeneas Williams, are going to be your kind of heavy hitters between, you know, between the tackles essentially. Love is love is rocked up a little bit though this fall. You know, he's added he's added some weight. So I mean, I, I'm not going to rule him out of being able to 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 run and get some of those tough yards. Like I would still like if it's in a situation where I've got to get those tough yards yards I'm probably leaning a little bit more toward Price. We're going to see a lot of them, but I do think that Love can get some of that as well. I don't think they're they're like just going to limit Jeremiah Love to trying to, you know, to run off tackle and and that kind of thing. I think that they'll they'll get him in the mix and they'll they'll uh, they'll they'll see if he can get his blood, uh, nose a little bit bloody. I think in there as well. All right, you got anything else on the uh, Notre Dame offensive side of the ball, or you want to flip? Yeah, it I over? think this. Um, you know, to to kind of end this, I think that there's a couple fun concepts that you could get into. You know, passing wise, that would be very advantageous um, to Riley Linder in the offense because I think at the end of the day. I think Mike Elko is going to um, err more so on going with a, you know, heavier box and, and making Riley Leonard prove that he can throw the ball, right? I think the more that Riley Leonard can throw the ball, the more that the box opens up and the run game opens up naturally. But I think they are going to err on Riley Leonard and Notre Dame as, you know, the runners and not necessarily Riley Leonard, the thrower. Um, I think he's going to have to start burning them a little bit in the passing game for the running game to kind of open up a little bit. Yeah. Craig's asking which back stays in for pass protection. Like the, like of, of the two, Jeremiah love has been the one that deal McCullough has told us is pretty much up there toward the top of the list. And I think that Aeneas Williams is pretty good as well, but you know, that's uh that's one of those, like, you know, like your, your uh, prerequisites, to getting on the field, you better have some pretty good pass protection skills. But in terms of who's the best, I'd probably say Jeremiah Love right now. 
which makes him even more valuable out there. Oh, for sure. <clears throat> um, so a couple, again, a couple concepts out of this 11 personnel where again, you know, Bo, Bo Collins is still the wide receiver into the boundary um, attached to him. Or the next guy is Mitchell Evans. He's also the tight end into the boundary. And then you go to the field side, you have Jaden Greathouse um, followed by Chris Mitchell all the way out on the edge. Um, I, I think a fun concept to get into first is, you know, using Chris Mitchell's speed to your advantage. So immediately what I would do, Oh, that's not what I would do. Um, <laughs> I, I would run him off to the sideline. Yeah. Let me yard go. the line of scrimmage. No, I don't think that's a good idea either. Here we go. Um, let me get – yeah, these. this one's going to be better. Um, I would get Chris Mitchell vertical now. And the reason why I would do Chris Mitchell vertical now is because really that's going to probably take two defenders. You're probably going to take this – this corner is probably going to go with him. And knowing that Chris Mitchell has the speed that he does, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt that this safety – would kind of be more so kind of cheating over the top, right, to give mm -hmm. this cornerback some sort of relief. And so what does that do immediately? Well, I think what you can do now is you can run, you know, basically a, you know, a flood concept, right? So Bo Collins kind of maybe runs, you know, like a 10-yard underneath route. Mitchell Evans probably runs like a five-yard uh, underneath route. Uh, Jaden Greathouse is going to – you know, basically replace Chris Mitchell and take this, you know, underneath, I guess, zone that you would call it. And then, oh, okay, how about we release Jeremiah Love out of the backfield too, right? So with everything crossing over the middle here, it becomes a nightmare of, you know, who is this being passed off to? Because Chris Mitchell is, you know, vacating the zone, getting two defenders probably out of the box right now. And say only one guy goes with them. Okay, let's take our shot with a one-on-one -on -one Chris Mitchell, you know, blazing down the, the sideline essentially. So I like I like this concept a lot because again, you can there, there's so many different you know, you're influencing so many different levels of the field right now. The, the linebackers have a lot to decide, you know, between Great House, Love, and Mitchell coming across the middle. Oh, okay. Now you have, you know, Bo Collins working at the second level at 10 yards. I just think someone has to naturally kind of come open in this concept, but it's led by using Chris Mitchell's speed to your advantage. Yeah. And I think you can probably sub a guy like Jaden Harrison, you know, for, for Mitchell at different points as well. Like when you talk about a couple of guys with, with high end speed who can potentially take the top off Vince and I were talking yesterday, you know, just looking at the depth chart, the guys who we thought were going to be the primary six in the rotation are the six in the rotation. I would put Jaden Harrison probably number six at the end of that rotation. But you know, you've got you you know you know you've got Jordan Faison in there as well, and then Jaden Thomas. In addition to these three that we've got on the field, those would be the other three guys you know who would be in there. So like you you could see a potential of like instead of great house maybe you've got phase on in the slot next to mitchell and then on the other side well maybe you flip mitchell over to the other side and then you've got jaden harrison out there as well you know like all speed all speed all good and i think that's going to be the fun part of what they do this weekend is we're going to get a good idea of what certain wide receiver groupings mean in terms of kind of what kind of play Mm -hmm. they're going to be running on the field, right? Like, I think you're going to have a more of a speed package. I think you're going to have more of like a short down. We need three to four yards. Let's put our big wide receivers out there to, you know, shield these defensive backs, catch the ball and bully their way down for three or four yards. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, you know, like I asked Marcus Freeman kind of about planning for the unknown when you're going into an opener, there's, there's always some uncertainty and, and unknowns and on top of that you're going up against a a team with a new head coach so that kind of adds a different layer to it but at the same time with Notre Dame like there's a lot of the same like even though you've got the same head coach and the defense is primarily going to be the same you've got a different offensive coordinator okay Texas A&M can can look and and see what Mike Denbrock did at LSU but and you know then and they can look and say okay we've got Riley Leonard but now there are all these different skill pieces that Notre Dame had, and none of them were really the prominent guy last year. Some of it due to injuries, some of it due to 
mismanagement of the receiver room, some of it due to just attrition because Audric Estime is gone, and now you've got sort of more, like as great as Audric Estime was, you've got more explosive, more dynamic duo of running backs, and in Price and Love are going to be back there who can do multiple things as well. So there's there's really a good deal of unknown just in terms of exactly what a and is going to see from Notre Dame's offense in this game as well. For sure. Do you think we have time to go through one more passing concept? Sure. Here? Let's do it. Um, here's another one that I like. Um, I think this is a lot of people might, I think it's called dagger. Um, what you're going to do here, the influential piece in my opinion becomes Mitchell Evans. Um, he's going to basically release and run, you know, like a, a 10 yard, what is it like? Corner. I would say post or corner or not post because post is going towards the goal post, but corner. You um, always, you always call the corners post for some reason. Yeah. You call them else. Yes, it's a corner route. Yes. <laughs> and then Bo Collins probably runs, you know, like an eight yard in route underneath this. So immediately, you know, I, I, I like the matchup. You have to pick here. Is is the extra defender, you know, gonna go with Mitchell Evans? And now you have, you know, Mitchell Evans, a big tight end on a on a smaller safety, right? Um, now you have Bo Collins, you know, sneaking underneath this. So if this defender kind of cheats this, if if he's starting to let me change the color here. If this, you know, safety starts to kind of cheat up here a little bit because he sees Bo Collins breaking in, well, that just means, you know, Mitchell Evans is kind of freeing up on this corner route, right? Mm -hmm. And then also what you can mix into this as well to really give them a hard time is, you know, Jeremiah Love can sneak off down into the flat right here, right? And so now you've really put everyone in a bind because is this linebacker is he, is he dropping in the hole and helping out on Bo Collins? Is he coming down on Jeremiah Love? If he comes down on Jeremiah Love, I like my odds of Jeremiah Love matched up one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker, right? But say he kind of – and then he starts, you know, maybe cheating down here. Well, then you have – again, you have Bo Collins sneaking in behind this uh, – on this underneath route. Um, and I think also what you can do on the, you know, the field side here is you have Chris Mitchell kind of, you know, fake that streak that we just talked about and just run like a 10 yard curl, just putting his foot in the ground and come back. And you hope that, you know, you've run this so many times at this point that, you know, this guy is now flying out, flying out. Chris Mitchell puts on the brakes and he's got an, a nice, easy kind of just 10 yard route right here. Um, and then Jaden Greyhouse kind of becomes the wild card because you can either um, you can either sneak him, you know, kind of underneath on this out route and, and really put this defensive back in a bind. Or you can kind of give him, you know, this this middle of the field sit down in the zone because if this safety over here is with that is, big body of his, especially yeah, if, yeah. if you have you know this safety you know tracking with you know Mitchell Evans and this this safety has shown that he's you know basically going to help out on on Chris Mitchell because his because of his speed. Well, now this allows Jaden Greathouse to really kind of have, you know, not one-on-one -on -one with the linebacker, but all he's got to do is get behind this linebacker and sit down and just have enough time where Riley Leonard can get the ball over this linebacker's head, but drop it in underneath this defensive back that's probably reacting late towards the middle of the field. Good stuff. Good stuff. A lot of possibilities with this, with this offense. Yeah, and again, I think it helps that they have – a multitude of wide receivers. And like they talked about earlier, you know, these wide receivers can, they, they want them to be able to play all of the positions. It's not about playing just slot field boundary. The more these guys can do, the more it allows them to open up offensively. Yep. All right. Let's flip it over to the other side of the ball. Colin Klein's offense that he brings with him from Kansas state university. And it's a very distinct offense for one. And I am curious, Jesse, as distinct as it is, it relies on the quarterback to run quite a bit. And, and as Carter Carls was telling us, and you know, like you look at Connor Wigman's career rushing numbers, again, not a lot of games, nine career games, eight career starts, but only 160 rushing yards. You know, he is more a true pro style pocket passing quarterback. What's, you know, like how how 
how great a fit is that in Colin Klein's offense that he wants to run? Yeah, so I think this is going to be the biggest because what we're going to get into with these whiteboards um, is Colin. We're not going to get into really anything passing today because I think Notre Dame secondary is going to do more than enough to handle their passing game, right? Um, I think what Notre Dame has to be worried about is Texas A&M's run game. Um, and if, if Wegman is going to be able to run the ball, because looking at Colin Klein's offense at Kansas state, a running quarterback is very, very important in what he's trying to overall accomplish in, in the run game. And I think if you're the Texas A&M offense, you look at it on paper, you say, okay, Notre Dame's secondary, pretty solid, right? Notre Dame's linebackers, a ton of inexperience. So what can you do to influence these, these young linebackers in the run game and give them a fit, right? And you know that Notre Dame has really good interior defensive linemen. They're going to be pretty solid on the edge. So they're going to be able to create pressure at the end of the day, right? So I think being able to run the ball is going to be very a very important aspect for Texas A&M um, in the game this weekend. If they cannot run the ball successfully, it is going to be a very, very long game for them. And I don't, I don't know that they'll be able to accomplish a lot offensively if they're not able to run the ball. So, I mean, again, like you look at some of Kansas state's film and like this was, you know, you know, Marcus Freeman interviewed Colin Klein a couple of years ago. And, and, you know, he's, he's very 12 personnel heavy, very 12 Kansas personnel. State. What, what, you know, what's he trying to do with these run schemes that he has and, and what makes it different from, from others that you've seen? Yeah, so he wants to go heavy 12 personnel, and, and what 12 personnel is going to do is it's going to suck you into the box defensively, right? Like you have to honor two tight ends, these big tight ends um, on the field. So what he wants to do is he wants to suck you in, but he also still wants to – he wants to suck you in, but he still wants to create an advantage on the perimeter with his blockers. He wants to have really at least two blockers on the perimeter – uh, in his run scheme, he I would say he is a more perimeter run schemer than a guy that runs between the tackles. And so, again, he wants to give you looks like it's going to be, you know, basically an inside run. Um, but then he's going to find a way to get these extra blockers on the perimeter and it becomes a number game. He always has an extra hat for these defensive, you know, these defensive schemes when he gets out to the perimeter, meaning he's got probably three blockers on the edge. Uh, to, to cover two defenders, right? And so all the quarterback has to do is get behind his blockers or the running back, and it's going to be a very, you know, a, a really successful run. Well, and like we did, a few weeks ago, we found that play where his left tackle, remember, he, the left tackle faked a pull and then stayed put, and it led to a massive run off that side on, on just a little cut out of the backfield by the Kansas State. Right yeah, back. so that's where it gets into – he plays a lot of eye candy with the linebackers, right? He shows you one kind of blocking scheme, but then he's, you know, maybe bringing a, a pulling tackle on the backside of it. So it's like it's getting you – you have to – as a linebacker, you have to have so much discipline and just trust what you're seeing. Read that triangle in front of you. Read the guard center tackle – in front of you because it's always going to lead you to the right spot in this offense. You just have to stay true while the play might be, you know, seem like it's flowing one way, but maybe the guy in front of you isn't taking you that way. You just have to stay there and not get sucked up in the mess. You have to stay true to your eye discipline and what is happening in front of you. And so I have kind so of, are you, are you saying it puts the most stress on the linebackers? Is oh, hundred percent. <laughs> These young linebackers are going to be tested a lot this weekend because of again what he's going to do to kind of create confusion you know for these linebackers in terms of their run fit reads all right what do you got show us something here yeah so uh, again you brought up 12 personnel both of these plays i have is 12 personnel so right now the ball um is on the left hash you have quarterback in shotgun you have one wide receiver into the boundary you have the running back split out into the boundary next to the quarterback and then you have your two tight ends to the field side, again, 12 personnel. And then you have one extra wide receiver also um, to the field side. So with this play, uh, I 
I wanted to do this one kind of live because I think it's easier to kind of show you what I'm talking about in terms of wanting to get this defense, you know, kind of sucked up into the middle here. Okay. Um, so what they're going to do is say, let's just say you're this linebacker right here, the field side linebacker on the snap so, of the ball. The most likely you're Jack Kaiser. You're Jack right Kaiser. There. So right now what you're taught as a linebacker, if this tackle blocks down, you as the linebacker have to fill into this gap immediately, right? This right tack or sorry, that tight end is blocking down, the tackle is blocking down, the right guard is blocking down, the center is blocking down, and the left guard is blocking down. So right now, with everyone blocking down, you are you are inviting the defense to get sucked up into the middle here, right? Because that's what they're showing you. But what they're doing now on the backside is they're pulling this boundary left tackle. They're getting him off of the, you know, into the, onto the perimeter. And now this, this wing back or second tight end, he fakes like he's going to block down, but then he also steps out. So now you have two blockers on the, def or on the perimeter, right? Um, but at the same time, the quarterback is still faking this handoff inside. So they could still run this ball to the inside here, right? But it, that's likely not going to happen. This left tackle pulling is, is going to take you to the play majority of the time, right? So what happens here? Quarterback fakes this handoff. And so now everyone basically in this you know box here is all sucked up into the run. This linebacker is sucked up in the run. And also, I don't, you know, this this is maybe some some Big Twelve defenses, right? Like they're playing Oklahoma in this game, so don't don't take this too much because the again the discipline in Big Twelve defenses isn't naturally great, right? But for some reason, this field side wide receiver he's he's basically running a streak, <laughs> and this defense this safety goes with him and the corner. So now you've got another player outside of the box, right? So you have. When the quarterback pulls this ball, he's got two defenders on the perimeter here. He's following them. All he all this inside lead blocker has to do is wall off this safety or maybe linebacker. And now you got a free blocker in front of your quarterback who's now streaking down the boundary, right? Because of what did they do? He sucked you up inside with that down blocking. He he fakes the inside run. Quarterback pulls it. Now you have an extra defender on the perimeter, basically leading a convoy of your quarterback into the bound or into the field side here. So again, it's it's a hard concept to kind of defend when you're showing this, you know, inside run. All the linebackers are committing to inside run, and now you have extra defenders on the edge leading your quarterback uh, down the down the field, essentially. Which again, you know, it's going to be going to be really. Just, just that that matchup is to what degree is Wigman going to be able to pull that off? You know? Right, and that's why I said it's important because this scheme only works if if Wigman can and can you know fake the handoff, pull it, and then you know be able to be mobile enough to get behind these blockers on the perimeter. Yeah, I don't think he's slow by any means, but at the same time, uh, he's not Riley Leonard either, just in terms of how he's going to run. So. And I think this is where it comes th in this type of play. There's there's two players that really become influential to me, Jalen Sneed and Jaden Osbury. You need to have a guy that's got speed on the perimeter that can also make open field tackles. Like in a hypothetical world, JOK would be the best player to, to defend a play like this from a couple mm -hmm. years ago because of how well he is able to move in space um, and, and make, you know, basically – Block to strut, get off a block, and make a tackle in open field. So um, it, it's going to be challenging. And, again, this is what Colin Klein wants to do. He finds ways to get an advantage on the perimeter with extra blockers. He always has a hat for a hat at minimum, and likely he has an extra hat where that guy is just kind of a rover. He's picking up anyone that basically shows up that he can block. So Anthony wants to know who's got outside contain on this play. Um, it's going to be a combination between your, you know, your strong safety, um, your outside linebacker. So again, probably Jalen Sneed or Osbury, um, and someone, you know, probably like, you know, RJ Oben, Jordan Batello. Those are the guys that 
everyone just has to remain di- disciplined. You have to stay true to your keys and you can't, what I would, pl- what I would say is play, you know, super superhero football, right? Like you need to do your job and not feel like you need to vacate your zone in order to go make a play. The, the defense is funneled for the play to go to whoever it's supposed to. You just need to do your job and, and yeah, stay true to it, I guess. And okay. I think, Again, I think Jalen Sneed and Osbey are going to be have a have a hell of a game if they're able to kind of lock down these you know perimeter runs. I would say. Well, it, and it and it feels like obviously if it's going to be a lot of twelve personnel, you're not going to see the nickel out there as much. No. You're, going to, you're going to see you're going to see you know more base defense. You know, with with the extra, like you with whether it's Jalen Sneed or Jaden Osbury or whoever it happens to be out there as the rover, you're going to see more of that if it's if it's that much predominant twelve personnel, which again has been what Colin Klein has done quite a bit of from his time at Kansas State. You got another one here to put up? Yeah, this is my last one. I I think I'm running out of no. wind here. I but... put it in. You pulled it out. Oh, um, this one is fun. <laughs> because, you know, on this play, again, 12 personnel. Now this ball is on the right hash, and the two tight ends are to the field side on the left. And this was against TCU, I believe. Um, and so you have – right now you have eight players in the box, right? Um, and so what they're going to do on this scheme <laughs> – let me – actually, I put the – I got myself a little bit confused for a second because I put the running back on the wrong side. Let me put the running back on the right side, and this will all make sense. Um, why this 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 is this is like as a linebacker, I can only like this is what this is what drives defensive coordinators crazy because it, it, this is a hard it's a hard thing to make. Like you go through as a linebacker, you go through the week looking at certain keys, and your coach is telling you, okay, when you see this. This is what you need to do. But what Colin Klein does is he goes against those natural tendencies that most probably linebackers are learning from. He 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 gets you to break, you know, your your natural, I guess what you would say, rules. The eye so, candy that you're talking about. Yeah, the eye candy. Movement just to get the linebacker's eyes moving that maybe doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it gets you off your own platform and moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, and that's the thing is it just takes one step in the wrong direction for these plays to break to the other direction, right? So I think this this one is even crazier to me. So what's going to happen here is the left tackle, the left guard, the center, the right guard, and the right tackle are, are going to show what I would call Aussie scheme or, out, or outside zone scheme essentially, right? So – they're all moving to the right here. The quarterback and the halfback are kind of moving to the right here. And so naturally, w- what does that do if you're a linebacker? You're not reading tight ends. First, first step first step by the linebacker is going to be to the linebacker's left with, with everybody moving you know, in that right. direction. Right. With that outside yeah. Aussie scheme, these linebackers are moving this way, you know, t- towards, like you were saying, they're going to be moving to their left. Um, and downhill as quickly as possible, right? These defensive linemen, they're filling in here. They're filling in here. This linebacker is probably trying to come up and set the edge, right? Not let this right tackle get beyond them. Um, and so, again, everything is moving to the left, right? So what does Colin Klein do? He sucks you up in one direction, and then he finds a way to get extra guys on the perimeter. So while everyone's showing this Aussie scheme, what do you think these two extra tight ends are doing? They're popping out here to the left. Quarterback fakes the Aussie handoff, and now he's got a convoy. Because I counted, literally seven of these guys in the box all get sucked up by this Aussie scheme, right? So this first tight end, all he's got to do is wall off this linebacker, right? And now the quarterback is following the second tight end. All the second tight end's got to do is you know devour uh undersized safety or, or defensive back and the quarterback is off to the races everyone's got a hat no one's got a hat for the quarterback and again this all comes from because they're showing ozzy one way and then all of a sudden these two tight ends pop out and lead block on the perimeter 
and it's it's off to the races for the quarterback. So how are you avoiding that as a defense? Watching lots of film, <laughs> coming up with a specific that's that's on Al Golden. That's not on me. He's got to have. I would have to probably I mean, your your natural instinct is what you just said. If they're all moving to their right, your first step is going to be to your left as one of those linebackers. So, like, are you pausing for a beat to make sure you know, like, where? <laughs> I don't know. It's hard. I mean, it, it's not like Kansas State was, you know, undefeated when Colin Klein was there, you know. So it's not like it was a an invincible system, but it's a very good system. Uh, Anthony, thanks for the super chat. He wants to know, do you think Notre Dame playing option teams helps against this kind of offense? It's not necessarily assignment football, right? No, this isn't really assignment football. This has to do... Well, it, again, with more so, I would say, <laughs> in a lack of better terms, you're honestly, you're kind of breaking assignment football. You're kind of going against these natural tendencies of, you know, maybe, maybe playing. You know, you're you're so used to seeing this Aussie scheme. Here's what I'll say: I, I think will be important if you're Notre Dame in this game. In this specific instance, the player that you would want to look at is the field side linebacker because his job. He's, he's not going to – if it's a true Aussie scheme, he's not going to be the guy flying over the top and, make, and and likely making this tackle. His job is to stay on the back shoulder of the running back, play in phase with him, and if he sees him pull the ball, he's got to be that extra help defender kind of popping out here. And now you have, you, you have the number advantage again, right, because they have two blockers. You have your linebacker your defensive end, <clears throat> and then your extra secondary player. So technically between those, you have three guys for two. Someone should be able to to get, you know, to, to make the play, essentially. You have more numbers, right? So I think what it's going to take, and, and what I said kind of leading this off, it's going to put a lot of stress on these linebackers. They cannot overcommit, get overzealous, get overeager. They need to play kind of slow, Slow to go is what we used to call it, right? Like you're moving in phase slow, and then once you see who's got the ball, you got to go and make the play. I'm going to ask you two parts here because Michael gave a simple answer, and I think there's some right and wrong to it potentially, but he says blitz. So my question is, Mm. one, how much does the unpredictability of Al Golden's blitzes counter some of this but two how much does you know you guess and you blitz wrong it can lead to a huge play that's where i was gonna um that's where i was gonna kind of go with this is it's a double-edged sword because if you blitz is if you if you if you blitz and blow up you know basically that running back quarterback mesh point right where he's got to pull the ball and make a quick decision that's the ideal circumstance. You get a uh, you get a blitzed un you know untouched guy, and he's just blowing up the play in the backfield, right? But if that misses, well, now you've created a lane probably for the for the for the quarterback, and two, you've taken a def- an extra hat out of the box that can help you kind of negate what we were just talking about, where they have enough of those lead blockers on the perimeter to have the number advantage, right? So. If you blitz a guy, you're subtracting out. So you have to make sure that whatever you blitz, you know, you get home. And I think some of these, some people are in the chat are kind of talking about, you know, basically the defensive alignment. These are the alignments that TCU and Oklahoma went with. And again, I don't think Mike Denbrock and his defense is going to be a lot more sophisticated Al and, and sorry, Al Golden uh, and come out and, you know, probably have better defensive looks to, you know, what, what Texas A&M is running. I'll give Al Golden credit that he's going to have probably a better scheme. Um, Jesse basically set this up based on specific plays that he saw in real games. Yeah. And credit to Klein because he took advantage of these. And the other one was Oklahoma. So, right. Yeah. Right. Right. So again, I, I just like every, every, everything that comes with blitzing, it's got pros and cons, you know, it's a, it's a double edged sword. You better get home. Or else you're going to create, you know, an extra passing lane, running lane, whatever it might be. But I would anticipate 
someone like Al Golden doing stuff to kind of mix up the front to kind of get these offensive linemen and quarterbacks off of their reads, right? Like you don't want to just make it a bread and butter read and do exactly what the offense wants you to do. I think you can stunt and kind of create some confusion up front. Right. That's going to be, that's, yeah. You know, like I said, it's not, you know, like Colin Klein had some pretty good success at Kansas state over the last few years, but it's not like it's a completely invincible system and Al Golden's defense being able to cause some confusion of its own, like knowing where the blocking assignment needs to be. I think that he can do a lot of that as well. And Howard Cross is really good off the snap of the ball. (laughs) Right in the middle of that line as well. I do know that. Jesse, some great stuff on the whiteboard. A fantastic kickoff to the 2024 season with the whiteboard. I feel like my face is red because of lack of oxygen. (laughs) All that whiteboard talk. The chalk just blowing back in your face. (laughs) I guess so. 